thank you so much, everyone, for being here. It's, uh, it's been so wonderful to be back. Um, I've been feeling so much nostalgia. It's wonderful to see Tara again, who was with me as I was writing some of the stories in these books. And it's so great to see the current MFA students. And thank you so much for having us here, really. Uh, so I'm going to read from Our Dreams Mind a Line first. And this is a story called The Boy Who Turns Into Toads. And uh, this is actually also going to be part of my project that, uh, <laughs> that I'm publishing with Melissa Goodrich that's coming out in 2019, uh, which is a collection of stories inspired by school, which is what I do now for work. When I drop out, I go where all the dropouts go. The jungle is full of beasts with teeth, but at least there are no detentions, no pop quizzes, no pencil smudges on hands, no teachers locking me in quiet rooms. My first night as a dropout, I turn into a plague of toads. I balloon my neck taut and bellow at the walls of the school for insecure and underfoot woodland creatures. I bellow all night. I make sure no one sleeps. I urinate on the freshly cut lawn. I burrow holes in the zinnia gardens. A barn owl eats one of me, but I don't care because there is so much of me. I think this is it. I'll never have to be human again. No more algebra, no more locked doors, no more being in one skin when I could be in many. The teachers at school and I had, um, the teachers at school said I have an insecurity problem. They told me I didn't like my human body. They told me I didn't raise my hand enough in class. They told me that's why I turn into creatures that hide in mud at the bottom of ponds and flatten their bodies under heavy gray stones. When they found me crawling in the showers, puddling under the spray of the shower heads, or splatting myself against the tiled walls, they would gather me in nets built to cut, catch fire, uh, fireflies, take me to the panic room until I turned human again. For homework, every student was supposed to do confidence building exercises. We were each provided with a full length mirror. For 20 minutes every night, we were instructed to stand naked in front of the mirror with our arms raised in a victory pose. The pose was supposed to trick our brains into believing we were victorious. Victorious like a lion, we'd say. Victorious like a hawk. But the teachers dissuaded us from using such similes. Victorious like a human, they'd say. I thought I'd never have to be human again once I entered the jungle of dropouts. I'm surprised when, the morning after dropping out, I wake at the base of a banyan tree, naked and fleshy and with only one pair of eyelids. My skin goose pimples with nakedness. I cover myself with my hands. The jungle is dark even though it's daytime. The light filtering through the canopy leaves is swampy. I feel for the part of me that the barn owl ate the night before and I find it a hollowness beneath my, my kneecap, a loss I could live with. I set out to find the other dropouts, the other wild children, the ones that the teachers warned us had changed into animals and never changed back. I imagined them living in a hollow tree like the lost boys, giraffes and peacocks and beavers and mastiffs coexisting in their wildness. All day I look for them. Poison ivy rashes up my bare thighs, my feet blacken and blister. Sometimes I catch glimpses of bodies between the leaves, a plume of blue feathers, an explosion of antlers, a tusk. I call out, thunder through the underbrush, and they disappear. When I get tired, I sit on my knees on a fallen log. I close my eyes. I listen for the pat, pat, pat of my heart's chambers condensing from four to three. Reach for the bubble in my throat that grows and grows until it chokes me. These are the signs that I am about to turn into toads. At school, I'd practice this in my dorm room in the early morning when I knew the hall monitors had fallen asleep at their posts. I could turn into toads in 30 seconds flat if I wanted to. It was like all day I'd been holding the toads back and turning was as easy as unclenching my fists. Now though, I can't feel the toads. My heart is big and wet. My throat is dry. My stomach growls with human hunger. I open my eyes. I think of a girl from school who could turn into a line of ants just by breathing. She was the only student I knew who would change only when she wanted to. It was never an accident for her. She didn't change in the middle of improv lessons when she tripped over a mic cord and we all snorted into our elbows. 
She didn't change when she got her period during gym class, and we all saw the spot of crimson grow against the baby blue cotton of her shorts. The girl who turned into aunt spent more time in the panic room than any of us because they knew that when she changed, it was always because she meant to. The girl who turned into ants would never turn into a queen ant, fat and fed and worshipped. She'd only turn into worker ants, small and strong and dispensable. She sat in front of me in social studies. Her hair was brown and uncombed. I didn't think much about her then, but I think about her now. If I was toads and she was ants, all of me would eat all of her up. Everyone's panic room was different. In my panic room, there were no corners. In my panic room, even the ceiling was round, and on the walls, heat lamps like panting mouths. Red, hot, unrelenting. They prickled my skin dry. They made me hop in circles, hop myself bruised. I tried to turn myself into stones that I could hide beneath, but I didn't work that way. When I'm toads, I have memories that don't belong to me. Frosty winter dreams of my blood crystallizing in my chest, my flesh becoming mud, wet, slippery, tailed memories of sliding through puddles, my body indistinguishable from my brothers, algae filling my mouth, the taste of green. Memories of yellow teeth, curled talons, sharp beaks. <clears throat> memories passed down to me like pebbles. In the middle of the darkest part of the jung jungle, I find a black pond covered in giant rim lily pads as wide as I am tall. It's not a large pond, and I wonder how I've managed to find it. I hope it isn't a coincidence. I hope it's due to the part of me that is always toad, drawing me to water. I hope this means I'll be able to change again. I'm feeling painfully hungry. The pain creeps into my throat and behind my eyes. It makes me dizzy. It makes my vision shimmer. Mosquitoes hover like smoke above the water. If I was a toad, I'd zip snatch them into my belly. But as a human, they eat me. Red bumps rise on my arms, and my only consolation is that the bumps make me feel almost toady. At school, we learned that if you act victorious, you will become victorious. If you act like a human that can't turn into woodland creatures, you become a human that can't turn into woodland creatures. All night, I try this process in reverse. I leap from the grassy bank onto one of the giant lily pads. It wobbles. Ripples spread across the pond, creating a domino effect of small creatures hopping from the banks into the water. The lily pad remains afloat. I crouch on its smooth surface, my knees at my shoulders, my fingers outstretched. Act an animal and become an animal, I tell myself. I dive into the pond. The water is soupy and warm. It fills my ears and my eyes, and I let it whooshing the air from my lungs in a stream of bubbles so I sink, sink until the mushy pond bottom is in my palms. I try to grasp it like a blanket and it slips between my fingers. I reach again, find a knot of weed and something hard, maybe a branch or maybe a skeleton, a skeleton of a frog that didn't bury itself deep enough during the winter and froze in the middle of a dream. I wait for the drowning to start. The human body will always force itself to breathe, to inhale, even against its will. A last ditch if effort to survive. Maybe my body's survival instinct will be to change. A toe can hold its breath for four to six hours underwater. A human can hold its breath for, on average, two minutes. But I'm not changing. White firecrackers burst in the corner of my vision. I kick and kick until my head breaks the surface of the pond, and then I breathe with croaking breaths, still just one of me. I chew on a handful of grass. I lick morning dew from fern. I watch a string of carpenter ants march up a gum tree. On my fifth day as a dropout, I return to the edge of the jungle. I sit in the shadows where no one can see me. I'm still not toads. I watch the school's walls change from gray to pink to black as the sun sets. There's one thing I want. I want to talk to her, the girl who can turn to ants. I wait until the moon is high and all the windows are dark. Then I stand and step out of the jungle and onto the lawn. For the first time in days, my feet move easily. The moon turns my skin gray. I feel my nakedness bumpy and bony all over. It is easy to find an open window. 
I hoist myself into an empty classroom and shut the window behind me. I pad down the smooth, cool hallways. I pull down a curtain in a common room and wrap it around myself like a towel. I climb the spiral staircase to the dorms. Quiet. I'd forgotten how quiet it was here. I find her room and test the knob. Unlocked. We aren't allowed to lock the doors at night so that the monitors can check in on us, make sure we aren't changing in our sleep. She sits up as I enter. I wonder if she heard me coming or if she was already awake. Who are you? She asks. I'm afraid to turn on the light, so I part her curtains to let in the moonlight. I see my reflection in the glass of the window and I'm surprised by what I see, a creature that isn't human or animal, hair matted, all collarbones and chin. Oh, she says. Her hair is in a bun. She is wearing long, buttoned up pajamas. Her blanket is folded at the end of her bed like she's never used it. Sorry, I say, sorry, I didn't mean to. How's the jungle, she asks. I step away from the window, out of the moonlight. I've noticed my own stink and I have this feeling that if she can't see me, she also won't be able to smell me. I say to her, the jungle is full of creatures like me. I don't tell her we're all there because we have something we don't want to control. A hardening along our spine, threatening to calcify us, our thumbs migrating down our wrists, shrinking into dew claws, vestigial body parts bursting like fire, fireworks from the places where our joints meet. I don't have the words for that, but I try to explain. I say, you don't even know who you are until you're out there. I say, I saw some ants and I thought of you. I've never spoken like this before. I think you should come with me, I tell her. She is quiet. She sits up in bed. I notice that her bare toes are all exactly the same size and shape. They twitch against her sheets. It's better in the jungle, I tell her. I can be toads all day. I don't know why I'm lying, but the more I talk, the more her toes seem to, switch, to twitch. No one tells you how lonely it is to be human, I say. When you're human, there's only you. But when you're an animal, there are many yous. You have all these memories and voices telling you the right way to be, keeping you company. As I'm speaking, the girl who can turn into ants turns into ants. She is a girl, and then she is ants many ants, all swarming together in a pile in the center of her bed, so dense and black that at first I think she's just a shadow. I sit on the floor and watch her. Worker ants are lost without their queen. Is she lost? Who does she follow? If I was a little boy, I'd use a magnifying glass in the sun to burn her alive. If I was toads, I'd eat her. I wait for a toady hunger to grow in my gut, for my heart to shrink, for my body to turn into a plague of bodies. I crawl into bed, and at first I crouch above the ants, and then I lower myself into them. Some of the ants are crushed beneath my ribs. The rest scatter like rippled water, then swarm back, an ebb and a flow. They crawl over my body, between my fingers, into my hair, into my ears, over my eyelids. I try not to breathe. I try to hear their quiet, quiet chatter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if I have time, I'm going to read one more uh, pretty different story uh, that's very short from my chapbook TV girls. So this story is inspired by The Bachelor. <laughs> very different. <laughs> uh, and I just learned that The Bachelor Mansion actually burned down in the horrible fires that are in California, which is awful, but also kind of amazing because I feel like it's an ending to the story I'm about to read. <laughs> <clears throat> the TV girls are 25 in number and looking for love. The TV girls believe they can find love on national television. We watch them stiletto out of stretch limos. We can read their backstories in the length of their hems, in the thickness of their heels. A has a secret ex-fiance who will appear on set during week four. B was adopted and has a fear of people leaving her when she loves them most. C killed a man in Afghanistan with a hand grenade. D is only half Brazilian. E has a pink scarlet stump where her left arm would be. F is 32 and has been a bridesmaid in each of her five younger sisters' weddings, the kind of girl who, in church bathrooms, has probably cornered at least two groomsmen, one of whom was married. 
The TV girl's stiletto out of stretch limos and slinky cocktail dresses, the tags still attached and tucked under hems. They wear lipstick and shades of mauve, berry, apricot. When the TV girls see potential husband, they squeal, gorgeous. They squeal, super hot. Check out those adorable cheekbones, which we all know is code for, he's attractive, but not so attractive, we'll have to worry about him straying. The TV girls all think that this might, in a couple of weeks, be reason enough to love him. The TV girls love each other. The TV girls hate each other. The TV girls love their TV mansion. The TV girls tell us they're ready to rappel down skyscrapers for love. They're willing to do the polar bear plunge, bungee jump off the Golden Gate, swim with hammerhead sharks. The TV girls tell potential husband, I'm here for the right reasons. They tell him, I've never felt this way about anyone. Some TV girls fail as TV girls. C goes home because she was having nightmares about the man she killed, the way his big sweat-stained pirate's jersey hung below his thighs, making him look like a child, and the way the blood spilled out of his belly like broth, and the way he didn't die as quickly as she thought he would. B goes home because she gets drunk on Charnay in the hot tub and punches E in the neck. <laughs> when C and B go home, they cease to exist. We're all happy when Dee makes it to week six because she's exotic and thank God the potential husband isn't racist. Potential husband is a good man, a man with a Southern upbringing. We're all happy when E makes it to week seven because she's really pretty despite the one arm thing and she's not actually competition, not really. The TV girls are five in number. The TV girls no longer think about G's lips or H's lips or I's or J's on potential husband's lips when they're kissing him in the pool at night, the water goose pimpling their thighs, the mics hidden under their bikini straps and pebbling bruises into their shoulders. They no longer think about the awkward silences during their rooftop dates because when that episode airs, the editors will hide the silences under rising piano music. That's the version we will see and remember, not the one where she tells a joke and he doesn't laugh, the one with the whirl of camera equipment and the tiny cold tap of a spoon <laughs> against a plate. The TV girls take potential husband to their hometowns, Austin, Atlanta, Scottsdale, Orange County, a farm in Oklahoma, and we place bets on who has the craziest family. We pray for crazy families. The fathers give potential husband their blessing or they don't give him their blessing. The TV girls say, I love you, or they don't say, I love you. Each TV, each TV girl says, he's really, really the one. Three TV girls remain. Dee learns potential husband will never move to Oklahoma. He wasn't really into her farm after all. She considers packing her bags. We say, hell yeah, girl. We say, kick him to the curb. But really, we're thinking, stay, stay, stay. Because when a TV girl leaves, she's gone. To leave is to fizzle. And what we want is to see the eruption, the split, the crying on the tiled floor. We learned through the tabloids that F used to be a stripper. She stripped for truckers and frat boys at a bar off Route 80 in Pennsylvania. And we can picture it. Skin against pull, sequined bra, pressing scale patterns into skin. Potential husband says he doesn't care what F did in her past. And we're disappointed, because if he shamed her, then we could too. The girls fly to Thailand. Two girls left. We realize we're waiting for something to go wrong. We're waiting for the camera assistant to drop a light onto A's plate of cordon bleu. Waiting for a nip slip. Waiting for the fuck the editors forget to blame. The TV girls are tan and flat stomached and sad and hopeful in their bikinis and sheer dresses, barefooting down empty beaches, plucking blushing guavas from bowed tree limbs. Tomorrow they will be engaged or not engaged. Tomorrow they will be carried off on the back of an elephant or escorted to a limousine, but we can't see past the door of the fantasy suite. The TV girls curl mascara into their lashes and we want it to run. The TV girls sweat pixels on our screens and we wish we could taste.